Well, it's great to see everyone here today, and uh, especially those folks who have been very generous to me over the years in their, uh, with their time, their instruction, and their support. Um, I'm fairly unpracticed in speaking, so I hope you don't mind if I occasionally read stuff. But, um, my work on laws of form has mostly been with the philosophical and historical situation. In my view, laws of form should be fully situated within the Pythagorean Platonic tradition of arithmetic emanation. The emanation of knowing and being from original unity through self-negation. This I explain in Enthusiastic Mathematics, my book. Um, but today I want to zoom in on the arithmetic itself and the order I found in its higher degrees, out of which a geometry emerges. The geometry is much like Euclidean geometry uh, in the sense that it deals with squares, cubes, circles, cones and spheres. It has pi, uh, square roots, it does map <coughs> into Cartesian plane, vectors and algebraic equations. What is different about the geometry is the arithmetic and the way the arithmetic is applied to the geometry. And this has consequences that emerge right from the beginning. And that's because the structure of, of a number as generated remains expressed, uh, remains expressed in its actual expression. So it's what you work with in the arithmetic and it's what you work with in the geometry. And this is even with irrationals. They are found to be infinite rational expressions in the arithmetic itself. There isn't enough time to go through it all right now. I've written it up in a bit of a paper here that people can have a look at if they like. I'll just try to give you a bit of a taste for it. So, laws of form considers an arithmetic whose geometry as yet has no measure. My approach is unusual in two ways. Firstly, it doesn't try to relate the arithmetic to conventional structure of geometry because the conventional structure of geometry already provides a ready-made interpretation of arithmetic. When we talk about square numbers, irrational square roots, the real number nine, even negative numbers, we are already working from an interpretation of arithmetic for geometry that has evolved in a particular structure through controversy over the last three centuries. Instead, we go back to the beginning and rebuild the geometry from the arithmetic. Laws of form considers an arithmetic whose geometry as yet has no numerical measure. The other way that my approach is unusual is that, um, is that the arithmetic order is found in the higher degrees. Its numbers are infinite emanations and infinite emanations of infinite emanations. We are not primarily dealing with value of expressions because the underlying value of an infinite expression is the marked-unmarked oscillation. In this slide, I give the uh, elementary basis of the interpretation. So the arithmetic starts with the ordinal number series, first, second, and third, and so on, which corresponds to the periods of elementary re-entry. I put a little arrow on my re-entries. Um, now, in exploring this geometry, uh, what I've found that it returns time and time again, it keeps reducing to mostly these three emanations that you're looking at repeating here. I've just done a bit of an animation there. So the first one I showed on the previous slide, just elementary re-entry. And this is a re-entry within a re-entry, and this is two re-entries within a re-entry. So you don't know it yet, but what you're looking at is the essence of the geometry. 
So how is this geometry? I'd like to start by um, using another notation, which I call tree notation, um, which expresses a bit more of the shape, the inherent shape of these emanations. So first we have elementary re-entry over here again, which is an infinite line made up of which each period of the re-entry is, is a line segment. Here you have the, um, the same trunk, but an infinite emanating branch coming out of every node. And this one, which is two re-entries within a re-entry, is two emanations from every node. Okay. Um, now, uh, I just want to start, oh, well, I want to say that, um, so where do finite numbers fit in? Because I was saying that it's all infinite. Um, finite numbers are only the delimitation of infinite forms. So you stop the em emanation after so many periods. So it's like um, a tree after so many years of growth, in that metaphor, or you cut a branch of the tree off to build your house. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start with these pre-cut numbers, not because they come first, but because it's helpful for orientation. Here's the first three simple finite numbers in the first three orders. So, um, number is number as in laws of form, and um, the order is the depth, oh sorry, numbers are, is the empty marks, and order is the depth of those marks. So um, at the zero depth, I could say it's kind of like pebbles on the sand. And at the first depth, it's one, two, three, like say pebbles in a bucket. Okay. Now, if you look at the zero column here, you'll notice that it's been drawn empty at the relevant depth. But you'll also notice that the, the zero in one depth is the same as the one in the next. And this is, this is basically because zero is not a number in the arithmetic itself, but only a place where numbering might begin. So only the place where you might enter a mark to make a new depth. Now the higher, the higher degree numbering is found to be similar to the finite numbering by noticing that order is placed, replaced by degree. Uh, the count of elementary re-entries determines the number of the expression, while the depth determines the degree. If you look again at the zero column here, you'll see that they're drawn to be empty at each depth. Now, again, this is because... And then if you look, um, you'll see that actually the form of these expressions are the same. So the zero is the same as the, as the one in the previous step. And um, this kind of gives the, um, the hierarchical symmetry of the, of the whole um, arithmetic system. So um, that's really just the very beginning of um, the arithmetic. There is so much more to say, but I really want to get on and um, show you the geometry. And uh, by way of the Pythagoreans and their hierarchy, of uh, dimensional magnitudes. Okay, so the early Pythagoreans were really interested in um, uh, gnomic expansions to build the figured numbers. So here I've got a little animation of the generation of the square numbers where the uh, gnomon set square was used to determine where to put the next set of pebbles so that you could generate the next square number. Um, now the most important amongst all of the figured numbers and the, these gnomic generations was the triangular number generation over here. Now here, here I've got the triangular, uh, proposed speculated triangular generation here, just running through. And over on the right, I've got the generation that occurs with um, sec the unity in the second degree or a re-entry within a re-entry. 
And here's just a hybrid in the middle, just to give you some sort of idea with the analogy. In this one, I've got the uh, square generation here, just turned it around a bit so it's kind of easier to see. And over here, I've got the, um, the uh, two in the second degree, which is, um, which, yeah, is uh, similar to the um, Pythagorean square generation. Now, the Pythagoreans um, had an order to this. Um, uh, they, they placed their uh, figured numbers in a, a particular hierarchy, which uh, corresponded with the hierarchy of um, the generation of dimensional magnitudes. So they, they saw that their whole kind of philosophy was around a, an originalist, original dimensionless point, then generating out the dimensions and the universe, if you like. <coughs> so th this, um, this table kind of gives a bit of an idea of that. So you've got the original point, and that corresponds to the one, or the monad, the original one. Then you've got, in the first dimension, coming out of that, um, as the point moves, it generates the line, which corresponds with the natural number series. And then, which coming out of that, you get the, the, the second dimension, so you get the triangular numbers, and then the square numbers, and then the pentagon numbers, and so forth. And then in the third dimension, you get the solids, which starts with the triangular py pyramid, the square pyramid, and so on with uh, uh, more sides on the base of the pyramid. So that's, that's their hierarchy, and it basically syncs really well with um, this hierarchy in, uh, in the uh, higher degrees of, um, of uh, laws of form arithmetic that I was showing you earlier. And um, I'll just show you, um, give you a bit of an idea of that. Um, you can see a lot more in my paper, but this is just the uh, plane numbers, okay? And so in the first line here, I've got the line, which is the zero plane number, out of which all the planes come. And then you've got the triangle of the first generation. I'm just giving the first period of generation there. And then I give the uh, laws of form or re-entry expression for that. And then below here, and this becomes very important in the analysis later, I give the, um, uh, the, the successive number of marks at every period, and then the, the, the uh, gnomon additions for every period, and then the interval between the gnomons, which is like this, the second um, derivative. Okay, and so you'll notice that the second derivative corresponds with the number for um, these things in the second, these uh, expressions in the second degree. So it really fits quite well together. Okay, so um, now another important, I'm jumping ahead, but another important thing to point out here is that when you actually look at the Pythagorean hierarchy, it is the hierarchy of the pure numbers in themselves. And that is different from its application to the geometry. So we do geometry of square and cubic space, and so we need to have a special hierarchy there. So in the pure arithmetic, in the Pythagorean pure arithmetic, unity uh, in each degree is line, triangle, triangular pyramid. But when you go and do the algebraic equations in this geometry, you actually, unity is uh, the line, then the square, and then the cube. So that's really where the translation begins. Okay, now I haven't got much time to show you much more, but what I want to just do now is um, show you another interpretation that allows you to uh, develop um, fractional values. Okay, so here again is the, ge the first generation in the square numbers. Okay, I've got them in Pythagorean and also in laws of form notation. Now this can be taken as one um, generates three, but we could also think of it as one divides into three, or one over three. So in the other interpretation, this would be four, as in the square number four, but in this interpretation, this would be one over three or one third. And so you can get all the fractions you want by either um, the unit fractions are just similar to this, 
or you have finite um, continued fractions to get the other fractions. Now, excuse me, what gives you the numerators? Sorry? In your, in your designs, what gives you the numerator? Oh, okay. Um, Could you repeat the question, please? What gives, what gives the numerator? So, uh, denominator and numerator. If you mark, the numerator is one. Yeah, that's one, yes. and that's three. Right, but now take uh, two thirds. You um, have one enclosing mark over everybody, and, and then another one over the two. So that's half. So you collected two out of the three using two marks, but the two is really the collection of two out of three, it seems. Um, I'll, we can look at it a bit later, but um, the way I'm interpreting this uh, on the spot here is that that's half, and that's one, right, which is uh, three on two, and then this one over here inverts it and becomes two on three. Say that again. Uh, this is half here, plus one, right, so that's three on two. Oh, and then you then invert it, because this does an inversion whenever you, each time. Okay. Yeah, whenever you put another um, mark around that, it would invert it again. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry I didn't have time to go, to go through that. That's, but, that's, that's an understandable word. Okay, right. But where it gets really interesting is when you apply this application, uh, this interpretation, to infinite terms. So, if you do, just apply it to... Um, elementary re-entry, it's just one on one on one on one equals one, okay? But if you apply it to um, two in the second degree, um, which is the square number generator, it generates like the continued fraction for um, the square root of two. So the square number generator generates the, diag the length of the diagonal as an infinite expression of the square. So the squares are related there. And there's a really nice symmetry here between these two interpretations in generating diagonals of squares, which um, I can't go into at the moment, but one of them that's really, it starts off with um, just unity. This is number two, as you might remember. There's two in there, but unity in the first degree is, um, generates the, um, the golden mean. So, um, and there's, there's a whole hierarchy of this, of a relationship between um, you know, the, the diagonals and the generation of the squares. And um, there's actually a formula for generating, um, to, for generating these um, uh, square root values, uh, which is a bit of like a Pythagoras' <coughs> theorem for this arithmetic. So if you know the lengths of the sides, you can get the hypotenuse or the diagonal through the, this very simple formula, okay? And then you can apply that formula, if you like, to the spiral of Theodorus, and right, um, the spiral of Theodorus, and uh, then systematically generate all the square roots in that way. And when you do it that way, what you get is um, that each successive square root contains the previous ones within it. So it has this lovely little symmetry. But the expressions get quite large, and there are other ways of generating. Um, uh, expressions for the square roots and for other irrationals that um, aren't quite so, don't have quite so many depths to them. So um, that's really all I want to all I want to say about um, about that. I think. And where am I up to? So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So. Um, so it's really just an overview, and I, I, and I hope I didn't um, lose it. I probably lost a few people on the way, and there's, there's plenty of gaps there. Um, but I have sort of written it out in a longer paper if anyone's interested. Um, but the important thing is to sort of uh, to, to just give you a bit of an idea of where this is heading. And um, where is it heading? Well, um, why develop a new geometry from this arithmetic? And I say, let's develop the arithmetic into a full mathematics. The only way to do this is to develop a geometry that's fully informed by the arithmetic. 
I think I've found a way to do it in the higher degrees, but it's probably not. Um, but it's probably not the only way, and it's certainly not the full story. What it does seem to show is that by preserving the form of the arithmetic, um, hidden symmetries are revealed that are, avoid confusion and complication of conventional mathematical expression. For example, in the geometry, in this geometry, 2 times 2 is similar to 2 squared, but it's not identical. And the consequence of this non-identity is that imaginary numbers are not required. Indeed, in this geometry, imaginary numbers are impossible. Now, is that a good thing? I don't know. You decide. <laughs> what was that wonderful or no? What, what did we get? Uh, well, I, I really ha I. I uh, well, okay. Well, I can give a hint. Um, well, because um, say uh, minus two squared <coughs> would equal minus minus four. In this geometry. Well, when it, when it says it doesn't work in a certain context, it means it doesn't work in that context. You might be able to shift the context and that would work. Likely how complex numbers work differently from real numbers. Okay, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Okay. So, um, anyway. I strongly believe that um, it's worth exploring uh, these geometries gener generated directly out of the arithmetic um, because the laws of form considers arithmetic whose geometry as yet has no numerical measure. So my view is let's <coughs> find that measure and let's build the geometry. You synchronize, synthesize that with laws of form. Is that through an kind of analogy? Through an, through analogy. an analogy. And then you with a, a particular hierarchy of numbers, an order of numbers within the higher degrees of and laws you, of form. And That's then you right. found um, that there was no existence of imaginary numbers once you did that. Uh, n no, uh, it's not to do with the analogy with the Pythagoreans that I found that you find that. It's to do with um, the way that the geometry develops um, with uh, basically with the uh, form of the numbers uh, uh, remaining expressed um, in, 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 their, in their actual expressions. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to explain in shorthand, um, but it's to do with... Um, the difference between, uh, so 2 squared is not the same as 2 times 2. It's similar, but it's not the same, because two, 2 squared is a plain number, and 2 times 2, well, 1 sort of 2 times 2 is a linear number. Linear number. Yeah, so these things are preserved in the arithmetic itself, and so when you go through and work with it, you get to a point where um, you realise that you don't have a problem with uh, with a square with a negative uh, a negative number being squared giving you a positive. So because you don't have that problem, you don't have to invent imaginary <coughs> numbers to deal with that problem. Okay. Now that now that I don't know what the consequence of that is. It's just what happened, and so it doesn't seem to. In what I was doing, I've been doing up to the third degree especially the secondary, um, it doesn't seem to be a problem with geometry at that level. 
but it might be at another level. So then, I, well, one other question is: so then I ask you, um, do you think that if if the Greek, if the Pythagoreans were allowed to develop that even further, would they have had that crisis of the infinite, where they were trying to figure out the rationality of scourge? Would they have, would they have encountered that in that sense if they had followed that track? Uh, they might have. Um, you see, because it's got to do with negative numbers and z different types of zeros, I suppose. Like, Pythagoreans had certain types of zeros. They had the monad, which is a zero, zero origin. But um, they had problems with doing things like we do when we start moving towards the negative numbers, because they, didn't, they, didn't put a, they weren't able to put a zero in the middle or whatever. So, so there's lots of issues around that that I think they would have stumbled over. And in fact, I think, I mean, people overstate the problem with zero in Pythagorean mathematics. But there is one way in which it was a problem and it stopped them, and that probably would have stopped them with what you're saying. Yeah. Again, there, there is no, I mean, uh, there is no representation for negative numbers either, right? Because they, it's my understanding, this, what you were doing, you were building the version of, of uh, of geometry that the Pythagoreans had, right? Which yes. is essentially discrete, right? You know, except they knew that uh, not all uh, measures were rational, etc. You, you have, you said there is no measure, but there is a measure, right? Because you, you get numerical identities like Pythagorean triples, they're, they're there, you, you have those included, right? You just don't have the roots, or, or you have roots, but half of them, right? So it means you don't have negatives, and that's the reason you don't have imaginaries. Okay, right? so, so I think the analogy with the Pythagoreans was, was with the generation of the dimensions. When you're talking about negative numbers and stuff, you're, you're saying, okay, so I've got this arithmetic. How am I going to start measuring space? All right. So so you say, okay, I'll do it with pacing, right? You know, like one, two, three, four. Okay, how do I do negatives? Oh, I walk backwards, yeah. right? Okay, so how do I create the negative end of the number line? You don't walk backwards, you turn around and walk there, and that's called negative. So you start building that stuff up. But the Pythagoreans didn't do that. So, so um, the, the analogy with the Pythagoreans is really just about their ideas about the origin, which was dimensionless, and then building the dimensions. And their general actual interest in, um, in, in infinite recursion, which is not um, brought widely understood. So the, uh, the, the whole story of, of um, you know continuous fractions comes from the Egyptians even beforehand. Right? So the, the, what you represented as continuous fractions was really their their approach to, to rational numbers. Right? But but I mean you have that once you have that once you have the Pythagorean theorem, you have a metric. What a metric is is really an application of the Pythagorean yeah, well, theorem. I mean, I mean, what I think they do, I think they do, but you know, like they have their dots, which is quite good because it's non-numeric, you know. But we have our, I think, our, topolo our topological notation, the, the containment stuff, actually is very powerful in drawing out distinctions that they didn't have and that our numerical system doesn't have. So. Um, 2 times 2 is um, 4, and 2 squared is 4. You know, it just comes down to that, right? So when you're talking about a plane number, and you're talking about a linear number, they look the same in normal numerical mathematics. But when you preserve their, their form, different things happen. And so you can see, what you can do is abstract similarity. You can say that um, 4 um, as... as uh, the first period of, um, let me see, I uh, hear. So you can say that's the same as four marks in a row, right? Or two marks inside two marks because they have four marks in them. So you can say, I'm just going to count the marks. Now, the Pythagoreans called that logistic capital counting, right? They say this is where you use the mystical, wonderful, philosophical mathematics to count your capital to count armies, to work out all these sorts of things. You abstract, you say four, and you say, yeah, this is four as well. Because they all, but what's actually happening when, you, when you've, got the, you've got y equals x squared, it's much more like um, 
It's much more like you're walking along here, and each time you take one step there, it goes out there, and then it goes out, and it goes out, and you're creating. So that's why that square there that keeps getting bigger, and and this is x along here. So it's you're creating, um, you, you're drawing a relationship between a, a surface number and a linear number, and so you have to you have to in some circumstances, recognise that. And if you do recognise that, you get a different outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do one more question, and, and then maybe one more if, if, if there's a burning question after this, and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you. So I was just wondering if uh, you could outline um, the law of uh, calling and the law of crossing and the uh, supposed sort of, you know, uh, that we can't really use them anymore, and actually in various ways of constructing number out of the form, uh, sometimes we give up one out of two of them, or sometimes we have to give up both of them. And I'm wondering if, like, let's say you have uh, in the fractional uh, in, uh, way of writing, uh, using your notation, so you have half, two-fourth, three-sixths, various ways of writing the same number, referring to the same number, whether those forms and those equivalence classes suggest that you can use, uh, let's say, the law of calling or the law of crossing in certain contexts or not. Okay, I'm glad you asked. Um, so, with what I have explained, um, we're not really uh, dealing with um, dealing with the values and, and, and working out the value unmarked marked because all of what I have explained is um, inf basically infinite expressions. But then you can cut those expressions off and and get for uh, to uh, get to squared for example, or whatever, and then you can deal with that. But from, in my view, that all comes second. That's like, as I said, you know, um, cutting, cut, cutting down the tree and, um, or, oh, I'm sorry, the tree after a certain amount of growth. That's finite, or you, you t cut the branch off. I mean, you're dealing with infinite forms which are truncate, oh, sorry, finite forms which are truncations of the infinite form, in this view, in this way of dealing with it. So, Chapter 11 comes first, and all the rest comes... Well, chapter 1 and 2 come first, and then chapter 11, and then all the rest comes second. Okay, uh, one more... Yeah, a comment kind of related to this comment. Uh, in, in your method of evaluating where cross over x is 1 over x, which is the way you're doing it... Oh, the... Um, the, the, the cross the, over x is 1 over x, right? Yeah. Um, then you keep the law of crossing because if you cross twice, you get one over one over right. which brings you right. to x. Right. So what you have done from that point of view, from the laws of form point of view, is you have rescinded the law of calling and kept the law of crossing right. and given a rule that makes us makes it possible to do all these evaluations. It's very nice. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now it's your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, thank you very much. All right.